Bro. Sorry, wait, I finished chewing. It's fine. Um, now, you guys had a class yesterday on first car after me. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. That was a test for a weakness. Did you guys have a class yesterday on first calf? Yeah. Yes. Good um, Okay, now I'm going to ask Speechy today about framing the debate, which when I first heard about it, kind of said to me, yeah, that's got to be about like first calf, right? So that is not what I'm going to be talking about today. You'll be pleased to hear. I'm not going to repeat that. Um, what do you understand by the concept of framing the debate? Two slightly different things. So there's language and um, that's all right. and, and a team line. Everybody, has everybody heard of a team line? A team line is a kind of a team line is broadly what we also call a case statement. So it's, it's a one liner. We we support this topic or we oppose this topic because, and it is essentially therefore a statement. It's not a summary of your points. It's not a summary of your arguments. It is rather a a single <laughs> statement that is consistent with all of your individual arguments. The broadly statement of principles. And what we're going to talk about today is both of those things. It's framing the debate in the sense of, and particularly I'm going to focus on the non-first gov positions, because you've had all the stuff about first gov already. And so in other words, it's what is it, it's that question you ask yourself about what is this debate basically going to be about? And if we want it to be about that stuff, how can we best achieve that aim? Because you don't rely, you know, first gov get to define, yes, but, you know, good for them. <coughs> they get to set up their version. In, in BP, they don't get to choose the clash. In other words, now I know that in some formats of debating that it's different, but that you don't get in BP to say, as first government, we're going to say this, to win this debate, the opposition have to do X or Y or Z. Okay? You, you don't get to say that. You can try it if you want, but I will take the blind bit of notice of you. The reason for that is that the opposition, the way we balance out the roles of definition and the roles of, of the opening heart in BP, is that the affirmative get the right to define, and it's the negative who, choose the right, who have the right of where to choose the clash, okay, where the clash is going to occur. But usually that's fairly straightforward, both because it's fairly straightforward in terms of the definition, there aren't many options, and secondly it's fairly straightforward in terms of the context of the topic. You still have to, as the negative team, you still have to negate the topic when you're speaking. Okay? In other words, you can't do this weird thing that some formats allow to do of reversing the topic. And then closing half teams, we'll talk about them a little bit later, also, when it comes to them, frame the extension and get to move the debate. <coughs> so broadly speaking, um, just sort of on that sense of um, choosing the grounds of clash, first of all, um, as you know, the standard model for a BP debate and for any action debate, policy debate, is that you know, the government, government team stands up and highlights a problem, posits a solution, which is determined by the phrasing of the topic, and then analyzes the impact that that solution will have on solving the problem. So that's the first area where you can't dictate the clash to the negative team. The negative team broadly has three options at that stage. You're either going to say the problem doesn't exist, there is no need for any action at all. They're going to say, we conceived the problem, but we have a different approach to solving it, and that would be a counter-proposal type debate, and then the debate will go into an analysis of whose solution is better. Or they will say, look, if there is a problem, yeah, and your, your solution deals with that, that's fine, but the additional harms and the indirect harms of them, whatever else that come with that, are so great that they they outweigh the value of the solution that you put forward to the problem. Okay, and then you have a kind of a balance of harms cost analysis type <laughs> debate. And it is possible occasionally to have aspects of all three of those, but it's usually not ideal as the opt team to try and do all three because essentially you are then kind of both saying yes there is a problem and no there isn't a problem or whatever, and you, you will get tangled up in a sense of uh, yeah a, a good government team. <laughs> will try and pin you down on what will become inconsistencies within your approach. So having said all that, when you, 
you are therefore trying in all the positions to set the terms of the debate and set the background of the debate in a way that suits you. And therefore, as part of your prep, you need to be thinking about not just what are the points we're going to run, you need to be thinking about what does this mean, what principled position, what kind of, whether it's a, a philosoph I use philosophical, not in the sense of a, as it were, pure philosophy, what philosophy are we going to run, but what principle is going to underpin your whole approach to the debate? When you're going to say, this is a debate where the central question is X, what is, your, what is that question, what is your side of that question going to be? And you need to come into the debate armed with that. You certainly need to come in armed with that if you're one of the opening half teams. If you're the closing half teams, you should have an idea of what you would like that to be as well. And I will talk in a little while about how you might change that, you know, sort of deal with what happens if the opening half do something slightly different. As part of that principle, therefore, this is where we get into the stuff that Philip mentioned about language and con concepts and stuff, you will want to start to push the debate into terminology and into, into ground assumptions that will help you. The, ex the example of this I'm going to use is a debate about um, that we're all at, that you know we're having a lot at the moment about um, about banks. You know, should governments bail out failing banks? It's a topic that gets set more or less once per tournament. Um, quite often more than once per tournament in some different sort of phrasing. You know, so anyone here going to Worlds you will need to know how to debate this topic because I am sure that a variation on it will crop up. There are lots of arguments for and against bailing out banks, which we're not going to go into. But broadly, behind that, if you're saying that we should bail out failing banks as a government, you're going to have some kind of principle behind that which essentially, you know, whether it's rooted in the role of government or whether it's rooted in just common sense economic theory or whatever it is, it's going to say something that essentially banks are too vital, too important, too big to be allowed to fail. If you're on the negative and you say we shouldn't bail them out, you're much more likely to be coming from a kind of a, uh, a broad free market type thrust that says, look, you know, if a news agent fails, we don't bail them out. If a supermarket fails, we don't bail them out. We should not be in the business of propping up businesses which, by their definition, have, have gone wrong. Right? In other words, you can't say you stuffed up your business, but we're going to come on and pay you for it. Going one step further, therefore, with that, both sides have an interest in setting up certain conceptualizations within that debate. If you are going to be saying, for example, on the negative, that now banks should be allowed to fail just like any other business, Part of your framing of that debate is going to have to be showing why and how banks are just like any other business. If you can ensure that the dominant um, sort of uh, vision of banks in that debate on both sides is one of, yeah, banks, they're just like any other business, you will have gone a long way to making the ground favourable for you to win your case. Because if we are talking about should the bank fail out certain, should the, should the state bail out certain types of business, that then becomes a much harder debate to carry on the affirmative because you do have to then very much go against a lot of dominant economic paradigms and quite often against the dominant paradigms of the economies within which this debate is taking place. On the negative, on the other hand, you're able to use a lot more analogies, you're able to use a lot more um, parallel analysis that is probably very favourable to your side. <coughs> On the government side, if you're saying banks are too special to be allowed to fail, for whatever, yeah, however reason, equally it is in your interests to, again, introduce concepts, introduce framing devices that do the opposite to what we just said, basically set up, demonstrate why banks are special, why banks <coughs> are a particular case. You need to be thinking about what is it that we're, that we're, what kind of language are we going to introduce into the debate, but also what kind of concepts and principles do we want to try and impose on this debate that will help us make sure that the, these li our lines of argument are easier to win. So you're thinking there about, you're, so you're thinking there about why are banks different and how are we going to be able to introduce that language in the debate. You may be talking about the fact that essentially 
because banks have had such a central role in the economy, particularly in the last sort of 15, 20 years, providing liquidity and so on, that essentially what the government has done is outsourced a certain number of what would have traditionally have been governance functions to banks. In other words, that you know, in some markets um, and in some areas of the market, banks have almost replaced the role of the state in things like providing liquidity to markets, in things like, um, uh, well, not setting exchange rates because that's, in, that's central banks rather than business banks. Um, but certainly, essentially, the, the things like flow of money supply and stuff like that, that banks have taken over a function of government. And therefore, that if you can get that paradigm accepted in the debate, it makes it a great deal easier then to explain why the government should treat a failing bank as a special case. In other words, it's not just a business. It has all of these other functions within the state economy which means that the government has a justified role in bailing it out. Now note that those are, there, those are not really yet arguments. Okay? You still have to do more work than that to go from that point to an actual argument. But what you're doing is you're creating a set of concepts within the debate, and hopefully you're trying to make them shared grounds of your, the shared grounds of debate, that mean that when you do put forward your arguments, you are doing so in a favourable <laughs> paradigm. Um, it's why, and you're looking at now a different type of debate, like social policy debates, quite often those are set in, in sort of place and time to, to Western liberal democracies. Yeah? A lot of social <coughs> policy debates, you will hear not this debate takes place in the US, or this is a debate about what so-and-so country should do, but you are allowed to say quite often, this is a debate that should take place in Western liberal democracies. For example, the debate we did about gays in the military. You actually need to frame that debate. One of the things you need to do is say, well, clearly this debate happens in countries where homosexuality is not illegal. Right? Otherwise, the special units we're creating up are kind of at the other end of the firing squad. Um, <laughs> and that, yeah, so in other words, that's not an illegal restriction of the debate. That is setting up very clearly, we're talking about countries where not only is homosexuality not illegal, but then you also need to say, you know, we're talking, <coughs> we're talking about countries where, you know, where coming out is certainly socially acceptable, again, socially acceptable enough for people to want to volunteer for those units and so on and so forth. Um, and that is, in a way, part of the definition. But again, both sides will then be trying to introduce context to that debate that will help, that, that are not arguments per se, but are explaining why, this, why the way this debate happens needs to happen in a context which is favourable to the arguments on my side. And it is legitimate to have a, one of the strands of the debate to be a debate about that context. Not a kind of, not a definitional challenge one, like for example in the banks, in the banks debate, there will be a legitimate thread of argument in that debate, which is, well, are banks different? And how are they different? And are they different enough that they warrant a bending or a breaking of the normal market rules and so on? That is an entirely legitimate for, for debate. I mean, clearly, if you're you know, in the context. But arguably, what you're doing there is, is you are, you, you're debating about not the direct arguments you're bringing in, but some of the characterizations that you're pulling up. So you need to be able to defend your characterizations. You, you can't just say, oh, we want to set, set the debate in this way because that's good for us, yippee. No, if you, you'll have to be able to explain why that needs to go down that route. Um, this all stems, and this, I guess, comes back to this notion of framing the debate, particularly for teams that aren't an opening government. The part of your prep strategy needs to be what the the very simple but often forgotten question of what do we need to do to win this debate? And that is often not a very complicated answer to find, but the answer to that question is what will drive, what should drive your entire prep and your entire um, uh, speeches. In other words, Winning a debate is not in BP about having you know, four good points and only two of them get rebutted during the course of the debate and so on. And that, that is a manifestation of what you need to do to win. But broadly, you will win a debate, your side will win a debate by having your 
overall principle come out in the tri in, in that, that fundamental clash. Um, again, going back to that bank cycle, right? Whichever side wins that conceptualization debate, what kinds of business, how should we treat banks, how should we view banks, how, what should they be, how should governments deal with them? Whoever wins that conceptualization, that characterization of banks, is well on the way to winning, having their side win the debate as a whole. Um, it, more broadly, it comes into um, other types of debates, it's things like role of government arguments. What is, you know, in a social policy debate, what is the role of the government? How can you and your team set up a paradigm for what government should do and how government should operate that, again, is going to assist you in making your arguments? Yeah. Do you believe that the role of government is to intervene to protect the rights of citizens against the actions of others? Do you believe that the role of government is to inform its citizens of consequences of their actions and then allow them to make informed adult choices? But those are two opposing, in many, in many debates, those are the two opposing paradigms of the role of government. How are you going to substantiate? How are you going to justify the one that you've picked to choose. How can you explain, you know, how are you going to be able to justify why your paradigm is more important than that of the other? One, um, <clears throat> are you all familiar with discussion of the role of agency in that context? Anybody who has not heard about agency? Some people haven't heard about it. Okay. Agency, broadly, I guess. Um, not like the men in black. Not like the men in black, no. No, no not, nor, it's neither central nor intelligent. Um, <laughs> That, that agency is this concept of, it's a broadly utilitarian concept, and it's a concept of how much freedom of action an individual or, or an actor has. And I, I, freedom of action is careful, it's, it's not about freedoms, it's about the ability to act. In other words, it's not about print, it, it's not about, it's a very practical concept. It's not about, in theory, I have a whole bunch of freedoms, but in practice, I'm a miserable factory worker and. You know, I, go to, I get up, I go to work, I get home, I sleep, I get up. Agency is about practically the amount of control that an, an, an individual or an actor is able to exert over their own actions. Broadly speaking, therefore, most people agree that the role of government is to increase agency, usually in a utilitarian kind of way, maximise the agency of its citizens. In other words, government tries to make sure that people have as much freedom to act as possible. The way that that translates into practice, though, is different. And it's, it's one of the broad principled differences between what we tend to call right-wing and left-wing politics. That more broadly, right-wing parties tend to believe that the maximisation of agency comes by limiting the role of the state. In other words, the less the state imposes on you, the citizen, or you the bank, or you the, you whatever, you know, corporation, the more freedom you have to exercise, exercise freedom of action. <coughs> Left wing, broadly, political parties tend to have a competing view, which says that under that, con under that framing, the amount of agency that individuals have tends to be in direct proportion to the amount of wealth that those individuals have. In other words, if you are rich, you can choose, for example, where to send your kids to school. Uh, you can choose where to live. You can choose what car to drive. You can choose whether to work or not, what jobs to do, and so on and so forth. If you are poor, your agency is limited. Even though, in theory, you can choose where to live, what to do, and so on, in practice, if you're an unskilled labourer, and so on, your, your choices of action are very, very, very restricted, and therefore, um, the, the paradigm of maximizing agency from that political perspective is one of wealth redistribution. In other words, it's one of we will reduce the agency of the wealthy by taking some of the means by which they exercise that agency, their money, away from them. And we will use that not necessarily to give to the poor, but we will use it to pay in order to provide options, in order to provide greater possibilities of agency to the poor. It involves things like a free education system, a free health system. In other words, you're increasing access and therefore you're increasing 
agency to people who otherwise would not have access to it, and you're doing so by taking a certain amount of agency away from other people. <coughs> um, again, these feed back into role of government arguments, these feed back into conceptualizations that you will want to be bringing into the debate in order to set up, again, when the clash happens, you know, when the fundamental clash is what is the, you know, what is the best course of action in this debate, if that is happening in, in um, terms of a set of sort of concepts and set of paradigms that you have introduced, you're much more likely to win. Um, other things to say about framing. And I guess just going back to where we, st where we started this about the sort of the, you know, the, the opposition strategy. Um, you should definitely, I mean, uh, this all assumes right, that the topics that are being set are ones which are reasonable and which are debatable and which are not going to leave themselves open to slightly odd definitions. And I'm hoping that some of, most of the stuff that we're going to give you later on in the week fits that definition. Um, but the broadly speaking, as all the teams have gone to prep, you will have a reasonable idea of what this debate is going to be about. Obviously, now, let me talk yesterday about how you therefore deal with that if you're opening guard. If you're opening opposition, because the topic tells you what the action of the government is going to be, it is reasonably straightforward to posit what the problem that they will identify is going to be. And you do that by saying, well, what kind of problems could this action solve? They're going to have to pick one of those. And of those problems, which is the more likely, both in terms of what's happening in the news at the moment, based on um, you know, sort of background context, based also on which they're they likely to choose is going to be easiest to solve. The, um, the one we did as a demo debate on um, you know, punishing parents for their kids, I think actually is probably at the other end of that. I think that was quite hard for opposition to work out in advance <laughs> what problem we were going to be solving by punishing parents. And that was one where you know, it, it could be about youth crime, it could be about bad parenting, it could be about social problems, it could be all kinds of things that we would have chosen to highlight. As it was, we chose to highlight juvenile crime. And therefore, what we were doing on the government side was, again, trying to frame some language in that debate. We were trying to, for example, characterise parents. Abs you know, if you are a parent who is not there for your kid, you are a bad parent. Not necessarily a bad parent willfully, but we talked about, you know, sort of certain... We, we used language that said it's not because people just choose to be crack parents, but we were definitely framing a lot of concepts in the sense of some parents just need more help or need a bit of a kick up the backside to make them be better parents, and that's what we're going to. But what the negative team did quite well was set up a set of frameworks, a set of concepts which were much more about, you know, they were trying to say, no, it's society's fault. And in that sense, you know, trying to set up a framework where blame is taken away from those people, and fault is taken away from those people, which therefore facilitates their arguments that it should, you know, if, if moral, and sort of philosophical principled blame and fault are taken away from them, so too should they in the practical sphere, so too we should take that away from them. And there was a lot of language being used about bad parents um, and, and so on, sort of no good kids and society's view of those people. Because each of the teams was struggling to impose its perception on the audience. You know, we wanted, we wanted you to accept that this is how we should view those people. Um, if you are a closing team, how are you going to frame that way? And the answer is, you kind of have to rely on what comes out in the opening half, in the sense that the clash is going to be determined by the opening half, um, in the sense that the broad parameters of argumentation are going to be defined by the opening half. On the other hand, with the extension, you have the license to move the debate to um, a slightly different level. There are, and unless, assuming that the opening teams have done their jobs adequately, really at closing half you're not just trying to contribute more ideas and more arguments to the same clash. The reason for that being that, as I say, <coughs> this assumes opening half have done their jobs adequately, right? But if they've done their job adequately, of the seven or eight arguments that can be put <coughs> forward for your side of the debate, the best ones will already have been taken. 
the, not you know best in that they're the most obvious, best in that they are the most central, best in that they're the ones that allow for the greatest sort of sophistication of arguments and so on. Therefore, if you are relying on the rest of the points, you'll be picking up the dregs and you'll be running a series of very minor arguments. And then the final analysis that the judge makes of the debate, when they say, well, even if your, t your bench is doing well, it's clear that the majority of argumentation, the majority of arguments that matter in the debate were brought in by the opening half. Therefore, what you guys are trying to do at closing <coughs> is to either develop that analysis that's come out of the opening half in a, you know, in a way that says, look, yes, they've got us so far, but it's only when the argument comes to its full final fruition, which is what we're going to talk about, that, that the whole thing becomes validated. In other words, you know, for, for our side to win the debate, there is a flow of argumentation, which is, as at the moment, is incomplete. <coughs> and by that, I mean a logical flow of argumentation, which is incomplete, and it's what we bring that is going to complete that. Um, or you're going to say that this, you know, the, the clash of the debate has been about this, and that that is that this particular clash has the following impacts in a slightly different sphere, you know, sort of indirect impact analysis, or um, do a case study, or say that that is but one example of a broader clash um, on a philosophical level, or whatever, and try and introduce something new in that sense. You should know at the start of the debate where you would like the debate to go. In other words, part of the prep as a closing half team is sitting there going, okay, let's assume that both of our top teams are adequate. Therefore, it's reason, you know, we can assume that the debate is going to sort of involve these ideas fairly early on. Where does that mean it's going to end up after four speeches? Where, is, where, are, where are we going to get left with this debate? And if we, if we assume that that's probably where the debate is going to get to, what can we do to take it on from there and provide new and deeper analysis? Bearing in mind, of course, and this is where you have an advantage over opening government, so opening government have to do the legwork to there. In other words, quite often opening government and opening opposition as well have to get the debate to that point. They have to have gone through the processes of analysis before you can get there. Yesterday, the Holocaust denial debate. It was very interesting watching it the second time around when everybody had heard eight speeches worth of argument. In other words, you know, the teams who then came back to repeat as opening half suddenly realised what additional arguments on top of the ones they prepared anyway could be run on that side because they were on both teams following them. And what happened, certainly in my room, and what I believe happened in a couple of other rooms as well, is that opening teams thought, oh, well, you know, this morning we put forward four arguments, by the end of the debate, we heard three more. Let's try and put all seven of those arguments into our case. Problem being that what then happened, what then tended to happen was that opening halves were very superficial about lots of arguments. What they forgot, what those teams were forgetting was that you still, you can't skip ahead. Right? You still have to get us to that point of the debate. We can't assume that, you know, and again, those of you who are used to sort of the American policy format where essentially you say, look, everyone knows the first seven steps of this, right? We say this, they say that, we say this, they say that, we say this, they say that, right, now let's go here. Mm -hmm. Can't do that in BP. You have to talk us through all the argumentation from scratch. Therefore, if you're a closing half team, you can reasonably predict that, assuming the guys at the top half are adequate, they will get you thus far in the debate, but they're unlikely to get you much further than that because they won't have had enough time to deal with all the argumentation properly and still get you to that point. In terms of framing the debate, therefore, if you go into that debate knowing where you would like the debate to go and knowing what kind of extension you want to bring to this debate, you get involved with the framing of the debate through points of information, largely, in the opening half. You are <coughs> putting in points of information which, which ensure that the issues that you want to extend on are placed in the debate so that you're not creating something brand new, closing half. That's, when I say brand new, I mean, you know, really, the, there can't be a really big qualitative shift. Your debate at closing half still has to extend from the original one. Teams that run extensions at third government or at third opposition, which are just not only completely new, but have very little 
principled or philosophical sort of um, continuity with the rest of the debate tend not to do very well. Because unless it's earth-shatteringly brilliant, and that the reason you're doing that is that everyone else in the debate was too stupid to realise that this was really what the debate was about, it will be a case of you will not really be contributing enough to the flow of the debate. The clash has been set up. We've had four speeches on it. It's unfair to essentially try and carve the opening half out of the debate by saying, oh, look, they were good, but they were talking about the wrong thing. We want to talk about something different. Because the opening half don't have an opportunity to come back to you and pull the debate back onto their ground. Your job is to follow and to extend, but not re recast and recreate the debate. Therefore, you know, what, what you'll often hear adjudicators say is, yes, look, you had an extension, and it was new, and it was all right, but it just didn't really fit within the clash of the original debate. And therefore, you only ever have a limited amount of input. So what if you're having um, a debate that turns out to be, um, have a lot of economic analysis in the very first half? And then you feel like that's been done very well? You want to extend on, on the human, humanitarian side? Is that yeah. No, yeah, that is, no, yes, big point. no, that's fine. So I guess what I was trying to say is you, but you still need to demonstrate how it is all, as, as long as you are still proving the same clash, in other words, you're still trying to kind of ensure that the same principles are coming. I guess the rule of thumb is the other way around. Any extension which either invalidates or utterly trivializes argumentation in the opening half is, is a poor extension. In other words, there has to be a, a thread. But it doesn't always have to be new material in the sense of going further in the analysis. Um, example here is um, a debate about, um, I watched it quite a, a while ago, about um, the electronic tagging of paedophiles. You know, I would say this debate about whether when paedophiles are released from prison after they've served their sentence, should we track them in some way? You know, should we create a sex offenders register? Possibly, and this debate is about actually having like an ankle tag, so that um, the, the the whereabouts of those people is monitored, even after they are released from prison and have therefore officially served their sentence and, and, and been done with. And a lot of arguments came out. It's quite a good debate. A lot of arguments came out in the opening half about rights and about practicalities and about impact and so on. And what the closing government stood up and said was. What there hasn't been in this debate is an analysis of the nature of paedophilia. In other words, that the paedophile is a qualitatively different kind of criminal, they said. It is a, it, you know, paedophilia is a mental illness, that therefore there is a level of compulsion, a level of unavoidability. You, can, you therefore can make certain assumptions about whether they will be repeat offenders. You can make certain assumption, assumptions about the degree of risk they pose. And by doing an analysis of that, which I mean, in a sense, almost should have come right at the start of the debate. They were then able to demonstrate through that perception why that changed the tone of the rights analysis and it changed the tone of the practicalities analysis that had come earlier. And they won that debate because it was their analysis at third which gave the greatest strength to the analysis of their bench as a whole. In other words, when the judge came to sum up and said, look, I was convinced by that analysis, the real, the key clinchers was that analysis of the nature of paedophilia, which therefore gave weight and gave credence to the earlier part. So in that sense, the extension does not necessarily have to be a furthering of the analysis in a kind of a logically con continuous way. It is any analysis which, which gives greater weight and greater efficacy to the arguments of your side. <coughs> Most of the time, that is an extension in terms of taking an argument further, because if your opening half have done their job properly, that w they will um, <coughs> be very well. But if they haven't, if they have missed certain aspects of it, then you, then you put that in. And that often does come back to framing. That's why I feel it's justifiable to talk about this this morning. Um, almost didn't notice the join there. Um, is that... A lot of the time when you are bringing that analysis, that, that kind of analysis back in, that has to do with how the debate should be framed or could be framed. <coughs> what you are doing in closing quite often is um, adding additional <coughs> characterization into the debate, adding additional sort of conceptualizing into the debate, which changes the, way, the weighting of the analysis in the opening half. 
that essentially in that paedophilia debate, what you'd had at the opening half was an analysis of rights, analysis of practicalities, which, to be honest, could almost have been substituted for any other type of criminal. Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily... It, I mean, it, it was a debate about tanking paedophiles. All the examples were about that, and the discussion of impact was about that, and so on. But the way they were being discussed was similar to any other criminal. It is the addition of that characterization of paedophilia as something quite different, which then, give, which then shifts the weight of the debate. So that's why I'd say, you know, sort of thinking about framing the debate, you need to think about framing it later on. Arguably, that, you know, there was a point of information, that debate would have been even better if closing government had stood up and sort of given us a point of information early on in the opening half, do you accept paedophilia as a mental illness? Because if they said yes, then they would have had to include that whole characterization of the debate at the start. And just as a, a tactical aside on that, if you, as a closing half team, introduce material in the opening half, it still gets credited to you. There are a lot of people who I know say, oh, I'm not going to ask any questions about my extension. Because if I ask a question in the opening half about my extension and it gets picked up and stolen by the opening team, then I'll lose out. So, no. We, work, we look at where those ideas first came into the debate. In fact, it is very good for a closing half team to introduce their extension, or, or not their extension per se, but to ask points of information in the opening half, which will facilitate the introduction of their extension when it comes through. And that is partly to avoid exactly that problem of relevancy. If I've asked questions in the opening half that mean that the stuff I want to talk about later it becomes central to the debate, then when I stand up and produce my extension, that is going to be at the heart of the debate. It is, going to, it is not going to be accused of irrelevancy. Um, that, you know, so, so that is definitely something to do, um, to think about. And a lot of those questions can be about framing, because a lot of extensions are about looking at the existing problem in a slightly different light. So, the example over there, we had you know, a lot of discussion of economics and you want to move on to sort of the humanitarian cost of the impact of an analysis. <coughs> Therefore, ask questions in the opening half about the humanitarian impact of whatever's going on. Which means that when you stand up and you, ex you are then really extending an argument which is already in the debate, but you placed it in the debate, so it's yours, you, know, you, you, you extend it on and so on. But it's much easier to demonstrate the relevance <coughs> of that argument. It's also why this is a very, this is definitely now parenthesis, but this, this one just, for anyone who's had me in as, an, as an adjudicator, one of the things a lot of people don't do enough is ask questions in the speech that directly comes before their own. In other words, say, I'm the next speaker, I'm therefore going to spend your seven minutes while I finish my speech and I finalise it, and I'm going to rely on my partner to offer points of information. You still need to offer points of information during the speech that comes before yours, particularly particularly given that you are the person who speaks next. In other words, if you ask a point of information and it doesn't get dealt with adequately, you are the person that is going to then be able to deal with the results of that inadequate answer in the next speech. So if you ask a good POI to the to speaker directly in front of you, you are the one that will get all the benefits because you're the one that will be able to tee off on that when it comes to your own speech. So there's a huge benefit to getting stuff in. Also, and you know, it is a much more direct example of that notion that you ask points of information in order to drag the debate onto topics that you want to talk about. If your big new point is this thing X, and that's going to be your big substantive argument, see if you get in a point, if you can get a POI in about that in the speech beforehand, it makes it much easier to say, and now look, I'm going to be talking about this substantive point because it's so clearly relevant, we've just been discussing it, and so on. It allows you to move steps further through with the analysis. And with that delicate noise coming over there, you. Um, in terms of framing the debate, are there any other questions about that kind of stuff? <coughs> Is anybody still awake? Who's <laughs> <laughs> dead? It's, 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 like, it's dangerous if you ask what information and you discover your, uh, your extensions at the second one. You can ask, like, you can hide what your extension will be. You can uh, ask, I don't know, not the direct you know, your argument, but you can hide it and, and ask the same no, thing. No, I didn't say it was dangerous. I said it's very good. I think you should try and try your extension. I don't think you should try and hide your extension. I think the teams that try and hide their extensions 
almost always come unstuck. You know, the sort of the, ah, we're not going to tell you what we're going to ask about. And then suddenly you come up as to say the fifth or the sixth speaker in an eight speaker debate, you're suddenly saying, and this entirely new and unrelated idea is what we now want to move the debate onto. It's like, really? There are only whip speeches to come, my friend. You are not going to move this debate very far if you suddenly want to take it off into some completely new direction. Whereas if you've asked it about a question about it further up the table, what you are then doing is saying, and look, this has been bandied about, people haven't spoken about it very much, but it's crucial to this debate. Here's why it's crucial, and it just so happens, by coincidence, I've got four minutes of excellent substantive material on that very topic, right here in my pocket, and here we go. Um, in other words, you're, you're pulling the debate towards where you want it to be in order to maximise the impact of your argumentation. Okay. Um, it's why, if you're an opening half speaker, you will occasionally get slightly weird asked questions from the closing half. Someone will stand up and go, point of information, and ask what sounds to be a fairly irrelevant question. And you're like, okay, weird, that will be your extension then. Um, and um, it's very common to hear answers like, um, you know, the question, do you think that X answer no? And if that's going to be your extension, you need to think of a better one. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's uh, possibly slightly harsh, but, but no, but it's, although I may have been guilty of saying that once or twice. Um, very bizarre people. Um, but seriously, I mean, no, that, that says you will, you will get questions. And if you get questions like that, just again, sort of talk, thinking strategy here for a moment, if you're in the opening half and you get one of those weird questions, you go, give it an answer. <coughs> it is worth, especially if you're the first speaker of your team, it is worth, after you finish speaking, having a little bit of a think about why you might have been asked that question. Because if it is about to trail, if you think, oh, they're going to want to talk about X, it is worth trying to put something into your next into the second speaker speech about that, because that way you assure you ensure that you are engaging with the material that's going to you know, in advance. You're engaging with the analysis of the material that's going to come down the table, which means that if it, if it's not very compelling, then that's fine. You've kind of beaten it already, and your closing team don't have so much work to do. Um, and if it is going to be compelling and it is going to be where the debate goes, you avoid getting cut out of the debate and you, know, you stay relevant. So it's worth having a think about it. Don't waste too much time. And certainly don't sit there and hypothesize, go, oh, they might have asked that question for three different reasons. Therefore, I'm going to totally change the rest of my speech and try and preemptively rebut what might or might not be their extension. Because it might not be anything to do with it at all. They might just be crazy people. Um, in which case, you've gone away from all your good material into this uh, irrelevant fact. Any other questions? Well, you, you were going to ask a question, weren't you? Or possibly even suggest that I might talk about something which would be good, because I've got another 10 minutes to go. I still think it might happen that the first team attempts to steal an extension. It can happen occasionally. Yes. So there is a way of framing it, of not giving too much away. I think this is what you intended with, what is that point of information going to lead to? What does that mean? So you shouldn't be too obvious in putting it out there. Yeah. Um, yes, no, that, that's true that, that you know, if you ask the question early, a, a good team will go, will try and... Yes, steal your extension, cover the material. Having said that, partly a good judge will say if you were the team that introduced it in the first place through a point of information, you still get a certain amount of credit. In other words, they can't steal it entirely. It's also unlikely that a team will be able to cover it anywhere near as well as you are about to cover it, given that they'll be trying to talk about it on two minutes prep, and you'll be talking about it on... 15 minutes plus 30 minutes in the debate, so 45 minutes. <coughs> so you will still do well. I also think that's one of those things where even if the opening half then try and steal it, if the debate has become better by being moved on to a bet better clash and a more interesting clash and a more fruitful clash early in the debate, you get credit for having done that. In the same way that we, we you know, when we say when a debate goes wrong, it is often the fault of opening government. And when a debate is good, it is almost always that opening government have done a good job. And we reward those teams. We also reward the teams that bring up the most important and interesting arguments. We reward the teams that create better clash. And if part of that is quite often 
Yeah. If the best clash is created by a closing opposition team giving a point of information to the opening government, then good for the closing opposition team, and that is a big credit in their favour when it comes to the final analysis. Any other questions? Um, I guess then in closing, you know, coming back to sort of vaguely talking about framing the debate. Um, Um, what, 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 I, I think the, 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 the question you need to be asking yourself is when you come up with your points, when you're in prep, you said these are the arguments we want to run, think about what the, in what context, in what framework, those arguments are run best. In other words, you need to think to yourself what kind of preconditions what kind of prejudices, almost, we need to have incorporated in the debate in order to increase the strength of my arguments. And if that is, I mean, and, and assuming that's not like, you know, sort of weird stuff, assuming that's, that's debatable stuff, how can we go about creating those characterizations? Okay. Could be through the use of examples. Now, examples are a great, great, great way of characterizing. You pick on some example, you explain it, and you say, look, that's just indicative of everybody else. And you, you create a, 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 an image in the, in the audience's mind, in the judge's mind, that this is the kind of standard, typical situation that we're talking about. And you have created a typical situation which favors your mode of analysis. Um, it is through, a lot of it is through language. A lot of it, and I don't mean um, sort of, uh, and, and by language, I, I just mean certain sort of, um, you know, pejorative phrases, affirmative phrases. But it is, it is through descript. A lot of it is through descriptive stuff. Um, some of it can be emotional. Don't go too much for that. Most BP judges, you know, are sort of are not. Most BP judges are just highly cynical beings, basically. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, the sort of the. The, you know, the teams that try and say, you know, this debate is about the mother, you know, who works two jobs, who comes home to her unlit apartment and is just doing everything she can to keep her little boy alive. That kind of stuff just, you know, gets slammed on the other side by somebody goes, all right, yeah. now let's talk about some sort of, you know, cynical real world practicalities. Um, there is less emphasis in BP than there is on some, in some other formats on kind of that whole, um, you know, sort of let's spend a minute at the start of my speech crying about how terrible the world is uh, and therefore trying to accentuate why we need to do what I want to do. Um, for example, creating an emotional context, which, you know, this whole notion that you, you say this is the problem, we need to solve it in order to make the world a better place. The use of emotion to accentuate the degree of the problem is pretty much always secondary to the use of rational argument to accentuate how important the problem is. Um, a, lot of, a lot of Australasian teams actually do that badly. Um, the Australasian format, where you have eight minutes and it's uninterrupted, has a, places a lot more emphasis on that framing and the context of the debate. Um, and it just doesn't work so well in BP. Um, can you think of anything else that one might have said that I probably haven't? Well, it's a little bit of a iteration, but, but maybe just a different idea. There's this very silly business term, and I think it works in this case, of thinking outside the box. And effectively, that is very close to this idea of framing. I'm just not sure if, if everybody understands that, that. Whenever you're debating, you're trying to build a box and trying to keep your debate inside that box. And whatever you said as the, the, the framing conditions of your debate, um, if you're able to do that, if you're able to build this box and keep arguments and everything that's going on inside it, then you're going to win. So it's worth, as a team, to always think about what kind of box is the other side attempting to build and what do we need to, to think outside of it and how can we break the, down the conditions. It's just a, an image for, yeah. for what Sam has just said. But this idea of what are preconditions of their arguments. I think this pedophilia 
thing is a, is a very good analysis and it's just that. If you accept that, that pedophiles are just like any other criminals, it's unlikely that you're going to get through with an argument that says they need to be tri treated differently to any other criminal. So if you're able to show something specifically about this type of crime, then it's very likely you're going to win. Just like the Holocaust debate yesterday, where I think if teams were able to show why specifically Holocaust is different from any other crime that has happened so far, it's very likely they're going to get through with the special treatment of this case as opposed to other genocides or other crimes that might have happened or any other type of free speech simply because this is unique. And that happens in a lot of debates. And this is also something that very often is good for second teams to extend on. That you find what is the specificity, whatever, <laughs> specifics about this debate. Why is this special? Why do we need to talk about this? Yeah. Because many teams, especially if they're not that good, but even if it happens to good teams, they jump to conclu conclusions very quickly. They start working on arguments very quickly. And they don't think about the problem at hand anymore. And they shift it away and say, yeah, there is a problem. But don't analyze it properly and say, why this debate, as opposed to any other generic debate that is vaguely in that area of, of clash. And that, that, that's very, that, no, thanks, actually. That, that is very, very helpful. <clears throat> Something, to, two things quickly to say about that. One is that the way you look for those things is you're saying, OK, well, what are the fundamental assumptions that have been made by the other teams. That's particularly a good strategy, like say, of closing. But it's also a good strategy for opposition. What fundamental assumptions have the opening government made in setting up the debate and in running the line of argument they are currently running? Because if they have, it is often easier to attack a line of argumentation by demonstrating why it starts in the wrong place than by demonstrating how it goes wrong somewhere along the line. Um, you don't. You have to be a little bit careful. You can't, like, you can't, for example, it's very easy for that kind of question to stray into almost a definitional challenge in some respects. And you need to be very, very careful that it does not. The other thing, and it's even more important, is that that always needs to be justified. In other words, the questioning of those assumptions, the questionings of the, that framing, it, you can't just say, we're going to question that and leave it. You have to explain why the question is justified and why a different answer to the one that they, would, they have given you is justified. So, for example, in the debate about Holocaust denial, um, you know, opposition asks a question, say, why just Holocaust denial? Why not, why not you know, the Armenian genocide as well? Question mark. To which the actual answer from government is, well, A, because the topic talks about Holocaust denial, B, because I say so. And I've defined the topic in this way. Whereas, because it's an open question, therefore I'm just going to say no. Back, back in the box. Whereas, if the question is, this is, if the statement is instead, you know, say, this is why it is unreasonable and irrational to restrict this debate, or, or rather, why it is unreasonable and rational to say, if you do this in one case, you should not also do it in all of the others, we need to have some analysis. Because if you do do what Jens is talking about and challenge that framing of the debate, that then the discussion of whether the framing is or is not legitimate becomes a hugely important thread in winning and losing that debate. Same way that when you have an empirical debate, you know, like the one that we did on, um, is it the one that we did? When, when, when capitalism. The capitalism, the capitalism, the capitalism experiment has failed. When you have one of those where you're not putting forward a policy, you have to set up criteria. You, know, you have to say there are certain criteria we're going to set up and then we're going to analyse whether or not the capitalist experiment has failed according to those criteria. And what usually happens in those debates is that the criteria are challenged. In other words, you know, the opposition say, well, we don't think that failure means exactly what you say it does. We think you have to take other things into account as well, usually because the criteria that get set up are coincidentally really favourable to the affirmative teams. Um, and therefore, the main thread of those debates tends to be what are appropriate criteria? How can you justify the criteria? And the team that wins those debates is the one that justifies their criteria better because it's almost axiomatic that if you win the battle of which criteria do we choose, you will therefore also win the battle. Therefore, under those criteria, my side wins the debate. Same with if you're doing what Jens is talking about, if you're challenging some of the characterizations um, in, a, in a debate, you have to justify it and you have to work hard on full argumentation to do that because it, it, you know, the assumption is obviously when you win the characterizations, you're going a long way to winning the debate, but you have to justify why you are choosing, why 
those, those characterizations are more appropriate. So in the banks debate, for example, there will be a very strong thread of argument that are banks just like any other business, yes or no. In the parents debate, no, the, the punishing parents debate, as you saw, one of the main threads of argument did become that whole, well, are absent parents really bad people or are they innocent victims of an uncaring society? Um, because whoever won that characterization was going to have a massive advantage in therefore saying, and therefore, the rest of our consequential logic now follows. So you, ha you can't just challenge characterizations without justification. But if you have a justification, and it's not a definitional challenge, but it is a legitimate broadening of the debate, why not one about saying, well, why is this, you know, here's why we think you can't say this is a separate case or a special case, and here is some analysis of why it's not a special case, then you're getting onto some really sort of interesting and important debate. And with that, we miraculously get to 10 o'clock. <laughs> um, which means that it's time to go off and have another coffee. Um, and we'll see you all back here in 15 minutes time to do some drills.